this is a home, this is a family, and uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. And in these days, it's very different than when the ministry, when I first started here, we've had to change our whole aspect of how we minister to the people of our congregation and the greater congregation. We have people even outside of our state uh, that worship with us every single Sunday uh, from this little place in Star, South Carolina. We are going to people right where they are in their homes. Uh, just this week, we finally have high-speed internet here. We had no internet except for our phones, and so we really struggled to be able to connect with our people, but thankfully now we've got a new avenue of being able to connect very easily and being able to be right with our people when we need to be and to be able to uh, just minister to the fullest extent, to still do the Great Commission when times are different and times are a struggle. Well, my family goes back to my grandparents and my uncle. Uh, they started Davis Greenhouses many years ago there in the New Prospect community. And so I grew up uh, carrying flats of flowers. Uh, people planted a lot of flowers back then, and so we got to be part of Anderson being beautiful through all this flora. Every time my vehicle turns toward Townville, even now, my heart goes home. How did you end up in the ministry? My family has always been a ministering family. My dad, he was a pastor and still is a pastor at Middleton Road Baptist Church. And so we were a ministering family. We just kind of moved in that direction. Uh, being able to uh, minister to people, so I naturally was gravitating that way. But I had two things in life I didn't want to do. One was to preach, and the other was to be in ministry. The first day in our 40-day series, uh, known as One Nation Under God, 40 Days of Prayer for Our Nation. God just took my heart, something that I didn't want to do, and He gave me a, just a passionate love for it. Tell me what's interesting about the history of Shiloh. When was it formed? In 1859. And what makes it unique? Well, it's the same structure that was built. It's been added on to, but the structure itself, the sanctuary hadn't changed at all on the outside. The first time I probably recognized anything significant was when I went in the attic. Because you step into the attic of this building, and you see architecture that is nothing like we have today. There is not a single piece of steel or a nail that holds the roof system of this church up. It's built with beams and posts and wooden dowels. Uh, the, the width of this church is 50 feet, and it's a single tree that spans the width of this church, 12 inches by 12 inches and 50 foot long. And I was blown away when I saw that the first time. I said, there's something special about this place. The walls are over 18 inches thick. Most buildings don't have walls that thick brick that were made right here on the property. In 1907, Drew Whitlock plastered over the inside and outside, then drew or painted lines to make it appear as it was brick on the outside. And it's still visible. But you gotta look close and you can see that that ain't no brick. From the road you think it's brick. Yeah. There's brick behind it. And it was really a fortress at the time that it was built. And so from that, I started to gain a little bit of the history of the church, but it was very fragmented because we had lost the history from many years back. Well, I started off at the Genealogy Society, the library here at the museum, reached out to the State Baptist Association, checked out the microfilm from Furman, which they sent to the Anderson Library and viewed it visited other churches surrounding Shiloh and got their church histories and just kept expanding and getting a church history anywhere I could. Sometimes you'll find one name or one date that will relate back to Shiloh. All the Shiloh records were destroyed in 1917 at the church clerk's home in a fire. And then again in 1998 or 99, somebody broke in and stole the safe out of the church and took all the records. So the records were very skimpy. And then there were families in this church that traced their ancestry way, way back. How significant is that to you as being their pastor? Yeah, we've, uh, we don't have any of the original families that are still in the church, but they're still the community and close friends. And uh, especially the Earl family. Claudius Eugene Earl was the one who donated the property uh, back in 1859 for the church to be built where it is. And he subsequently died just two years later uh, in the war. Uh, so this young man with vision, really was a young man, so this young man with vision took and 
planted a seed here that a church could be erected to be a beacon in this community. And uh, those families even today uh, are still a, a vital connection to the ministry of this church and we're grateful for them. It's a long heritage. The Earl family, yes, they donated the land where the cemetery was located. They were builders of the church and also builders of the community. Uh, the ones that we talk about are the ones that lived in the Evergreen Plantation. The lady from Georgia brought her mother who lives in Anderson, who was an Earl by the cemetery. And they slid it under the door. Really? Of the fellowship hall with another version of the history with a lot of notes added on the margins and between the lines. Y'all are such big eaters at your church. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Mr. Dixon, who we interviewed, you know, he mentioned his mother, Miss Nonnie, and that she baked the uh, best butter, he called them butter biscuits, and they were always served at all the um, dinners on the ground. The other thing that sets Shiloh apart from what I've been told mm -hmm. is when you all have dinner on the ground, it's something to behold. That's right. I think there's an old adage that says putting on the dog. I guess they take them to a really big meal, and that's the way we do. Uh, we don't cook out of a package. It's from scratch. And, and so when we have homecomings, it is a spread of food, and it's just a great time to get together. And uh, I know that most people look more forward to the meals than they do my preaching. <laughs> but, and the desserts are supposed to be something out of this world. They are. A year ago today, things are going normal, regular routine services, and then the pandemic hits. Yeah. How did this relatively small country church adapt to what was now becoming a different way of worship? Mm -hmm. Well, I believe when it first started for us being in a small rural community in a small country church, we didn't feel the effects of it more till April and May when the virus really started impacting our area. But we did have a couple of months where we didn't meet regularly. But in the middle of all that, uh, we had limited resources, no internet, uh, no way to connect with the people. So Facebook Live was our only way uh, to connect with the people. And so we would just set a telephone right in front of the pulpit. And uh, if it was one of those Sundays when we didn't meet, I'd be preaching straight into the phone. And we'd be singing straight into the phone. And it gave us some window be able to minister to our people. There's nothing like being in church together, but this gave us a great surrogate to be able to still connect and to advance the kingdom of God and the ministry that God has put us here to do. And then somebody came up with the idea we can have high-speed internet at our church. How did that come about? Yeah. Well, it was really more than anything, a postcard came in the mail uh, from a company, FiberLink in Anderson, and they said high-speed internet is now available in your area. And so we just erected a 40-foot tower out here that gives us high-speed internet, the fastest speeds that we will ever need. And do you think going forward that we'll ever go back to the old way of worship, the way it used to be completely? I think church is forever changed, um, not the message but the method of how we engage with our people, I believe that's forever changed. There will be those people who are going to come and to be in God's house, and, and I love that. I enjoy assembling together, but just as we found out during this pandemic, we're connecting with people uh, on every week base, people that are in Kentucky that have connections to us, and they're, they're part of our services every single week. Uh, people even overseas that are able to connect to be a part, people in Canada, uh, that missionaries that we support around the world, Kathmandu, Nepal, uh, people we're able just to connect with. Uh, so we're seeing what was, seemed like a disaster to us. God has used it to break us out of a shell of just ministering right here. So not only are we ministering here, we're branching in the community more than we've ever branched and around the world.